All right, guys, grab your coffee. Today we're talking about legal issues. Yay! Uh, today we're uh, talking to entertainment attorney Mark Litwack about all the things you need to do on a legal side to protect yourself while you're making your movie. So uh, I'm really happy. To, you know, this is really important to know, guys, so please listen to this. Even though I know it's legal stuff, it's really important. Welcome to the Indie Film Academy Podcast, where it's all about learning how to make and market your independent film online. And now your host, Jason Buff. Hey guys, it's Jason Buff here with the Indie Film Academy Podcast. Today we're going to be talking with Mark Litwack about um, the legal aspects of making a film and things like contracts and protecting yourself, making sure that you have, uh, basically that you own your film. I mean, uh, it's it's a fairly... Uh, it's not, it's something that a lot of people don't talk about, but it, when you go to somebody to try and, you know, sell your film, how do you say, how do you establish that you actually own the film? You know, what are the papers? What are, what are the, um, what's the chain of ownership? Do you, do you own the screenplay or do you have the right to use the screenplay? Do you have the right to put these actors in your, your film? Are there going to be legal issues with music? Are there going to be issues with, um, the work that people have put into the to the film. So these are all things that you have to consider when you're dealing with the the legal side of your um, film. And there's there's ways to do it without going broke. But you don't want to get to the end of the process. And you know some of the other people we've talked to have, have also mentioned this that a lot of films go to um, film festivals or, or film markets and places like that, and, and they try to sell their film, and they they can't actually sell their film because they don't have the right document. So you just want to make sure that you have a lawyer helping you out through the process. As always, don't forget to subscribe and leave a review for the podcast and check us out at IndieFilmAcademy.com. Sign up for our newsletter and we'll send you a free ebook. Indie Film Academy is sponsored by PrintDirtCheap.com. PrintDirtCheap.com offers extremely high quality at a very, very low price. They can do anything from CD inserts, cards, posters, banners, catalogs, and calendars. And if you use the code IFA podcast, they will give you 20% off. So check that out. Now let's go to the interview. In general on a film, when is the, the part of the process that you, if you were in a perfect world, that you would be brought into a film project? If money is not an issue, you should probably uh, retain an attorney early on. But for independent filmmakers, money is often an issue. And I guess you need to bring in an attorney depending upon when there are uh, legal issues that you need assistance on that will determine um, which path to take and how to proceed. Um, I just received a call this morning from, from a, a writer who's planning to write a script hasn't even written the script, but he had questions about what he could do or not do because the script involved depicting real uh, 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 people who at one point were alive and and um, and he needed to know, you know, what, what was he allowed to do under the law without getting sued. There are other instances where you have a script that's entirely fictional and it's entirely original. In other words, it's not based upon anyone else's work where perhaps you, you don't need to get advice that early on before you start writing the script, but only when you get to the point where you're going to actually produce the material might you need some help. Okay. And, and are there any common mistakes that you find with producers when, when they're just starting the process? Well, I think, I think um, one common mistake is a lot of times producers, you know, um, they just use uh, contracts, you know, to make their movie that they got from some other shoot or some other place or off the internet and they may or may not be appropriate. And what happens is after the movie is completed, uh, assuming they make a, a really good movie, because if they make a terrible movie and it's only going to be exhibited in their home to their friends and family, it doesn't much matter if they didn't have the paperwork <laughs> in order. But assuming they make a, a good movie and distributors are interested in it and film festivals want to show it, um, at some point, they're going to probably have to buy E&O insurance. They're not going to get a film distributed, exhibited in the United States, even on just home video, without having that insurance. And I think most filmmakers are kind of surprised when they see the application form, how long and detailed it is, and all the questions that are being asked. 
because the insurance companies basically would like your premium dollar, but don't particularly want to take any more risk than they have to. So what happens is if they just borrowed some contracts from another shoot, they may or may not, you know, be appropriate. Um, and if they're not appropriate, then someone has to fix them. And sometimes that's a problem because sometimes you can't go back, you can't find some of your actors and to get them to re-execute, you know, a better version of the contract that they signed. So if you can't find those people, you might have a very good film, but for insurance purposes, no distributor will touch it. Now, is it okay in certain circumstances where they don't have a, a big budget for the filmmakers to or the producers to come to you when you just look at the documents I've already created and make sure that they'll work? Well, we can we can do that, but it, that, that doesn't necessarily save any time or legal bills because okay. if you give me a badly drafted contract and I have to spend two hours fixing it and rewriting it, you know, to make it good. It would be a lot simpler if I just use one of the templates on my computer. I have thousands of them that was pretty close, 95% of the way there, and just, you know, pick the right template and filled in the information. It would be much faster and more efficient and would cost the filmmaker a lot less. So fill, filling it out it is not necessarily a tremendous help if it's the wrong form to begin with. <laughs> I mean, when you, when you hire a lawyer, what you're doing is you're hiring someone with some expertise to figure out what you need. And what you need is not the same in, in all scenarios. What which, which you need, you know, depends upon the circumstances of your shoot, whether it's an original script, whether it's based on some other work, whether, whether you wrote the script, whether you have to acquire rights from another writer, you know, depends upon who, who directed it. it. A lot depends upon whether it's union or non-union. And, you know, so you need you need someone who, who can understand, um, you know, what is the appropriate uh, circumstances and what is the appropriate uh, document. If you just blindly just take another contract, you know, it may or may not be appropriate. It's sort of like, you know, you, 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 you're feeling ill and you want to save the expense of going to a doctor. So you know that the last time you were sick, you went to the pharmacy and you got a blue pill. So this time you figure, well, we just skip going to the doctor and go to the pharmacy and get a blue pill. Well, it's possible you get the right pill for, for your ailment, but since the doctor hasn't seen you, you, you may very well get a pill, assuming you could get a pill from a pharmacy without a prescription, that's completely inappropriate to whatever ails you. So it's the, it's the same thing, you know, with, with uh, the legal documents. That, you know, there's not just one type of legal document. For instance, when you're hiring actors, it could be a direct employment or it could be what's called a loan out deal where you hire them through their company. It could be a union deal or it could be a non-union deal. And there's lots of variations, you know, in, in hiring them as to, you know, what, what the deal terms are. And so the contract, you know, has to be adjusted. So you can't, for example, just do a generic release form with your actors and, and even if they're not... Um like SAG or whatever, you would have to have something very specific to their situation. Well, when, when you say generic, meaning, yeah, I mean, there's, first of all, if you're hiring actors as compared to subjects in a documentary, they're, they're not exactly the same thing. When you hire actors, it's a little bit different than if you interview someone for your documentary film. So one, well, I would call a subject for the documentary, the other is an, uh, an actor when you hire an actor to be in your movie, you need to, you, you don't need just a release. You need what's called a work for hire agreement. It has to have a paragraph in it that says that their contribution to your film, their performance, is going to be owned by you as their employer. And if you don't do that, then you don't own the complete copyright in your your film. And imagine spending all this time and effort making the movie and then finding out you know you don't really own it all. So you need you need to have the the correct form. When you hire an actor, it's usually as an employee, not as an independent contractor. Having them sign a release is, is not um, usually you know, sufficient. Um, and if the actor is a minor, you, there's other concerns that need to be addressed. And, and there, there may be other issues a, a, as well. And what, what would you consider the most important documents for establishing um, the chain of ownership? That's, that's what it's referred to, right? The chain or the... Chain of title. Chain of title. 
Well, the most important document is probably a, a document that's critical that you can't fill out yourself. I mean, a lot of times filmmakers wear, wear different hats. And if you're the filmmaker and you're the producer and you're also the director and you're also the writer, I would not be too concerned about having a, an employment contract between your LLC or your corporation and yourself because you could always get that later. You're not going to disappear. But if you're, if you're hiring an actor or a cinematographer and, and um, you know, uh, you, you don't get around to doing the paperwork until eight months after the film wraps and you can't find these people, um, you have a serious, serious problem. So, you know, so the answer is it depends upon the circumstances. For filmmakers who write their own script and they're directing their own movie, their own personal contracts may be eventually needed, especially if the movie is going to be owned by an entity other than themselves, like an LLC or a corporation. But, you know, it's not, it's not that urgent. On the other hand, if you're a, a, a filmmaker, but you're really in the producer role and you're hiring a director, you, you, better, you, be, you better have a contract with that person and it should really be in place before they begin work on directing your movie. Okay, now you mentioned an LLC. Is it absolutely important for every film to become an LLC? No, it doesn't need, you don't always need to become an LLC or incorporate, but there's certain advantages. The advantages are, are basically two. One is is limited liability. If you set up your your business of making the movie in the form of an LLC or corporation, in the eyes of the law, they're seen as a separate legal entity from you personally. And so if the entity that's making the movie, let's say it's an LLC, signs a contract for equipment and eventually there's some sort of a contract dispute and a lawsuit, you're not personally liable. And your home and your car and your personal assets wouldn't be liable unless you... Uh, signed a guarantee to the contract, just your company would, would be liable. Um, so liability is one issue. And the other issue is taxes. Some, sometimes incorporating or setting up an LLC can save you some money on taxes. On the other hand, it, there's also an expense in setting up an LLC, and the entity is probably also subject to taxes. So the answer is it depends upon the circumstances. But certainly there's, there's filmmakers who've made um, movies in their own name you know, or they filed what's called a DBA, a fictitious business statement. You know, it's it's John Smith DBA Serendipity Productions because they just want a, a fancy name for their for their company, but it's not actually a separate entity. It's just sort of an alias. It doesn't give you any any uh, protection from liability, but but it does give you something nice to put on your letterhead other than your name. Right. Is, uh, do you need an LLC for things like fundraising and for having investors and things like that? It depends. Um, I, I would say most of the time when you have outside investors, in other words, it's not coming out of your own pocket, um, usually an LLC is used because an LLC is a very flexible vehicle. It allows you to have a, a investors who can put in different amounts of money and have different interests, different shares of uh, profits. So nowadays, most of the time, you know, we set it up as an LLC. Um, your investors, you know, may not want to write you a check and not also own a piece of the company that's going to own the film. They can't really own you because slavery is no longer allowed. <laughs> but but if you set up an LLC, they could be a part owner of the LLC, and they might that might make a difference in whether they're willing to you know write you a check, especially if it's a big check. Okay. Now, when you work with uh, a film and their financing, are you involved with like different ways that they're raising money, or just the legal aspects of it? Well, we're we're in, we're in, we're involved in the legal work to okay. enable them to raise money and and maybe negotiating with other parties, but we're not fundraisers. We don't we don't go out and beat the bushes right. to find the money. <laughs> So what, what would you say are the most typical ways you see of, of independent films raising money? Is it primarily from donors or is it things like sponsorships and, and you know? I would say it's friends and family. And more recently, <laughs> people have had luck with Kickstarter campaigns. Okay. I mean, I think a lot depends upon the, the budget of the film and the, the filmmaker and what kind of relationships they have. Uh, the easiest way to, you know, finance a film is to be rich and just you know, finance it out of your own pocket. That's very simple, uh, especially from a legal point of view. But um, in many instances, that's not possible. I would say a lot of a lot of uh, filmmakers 
get their start with financial help from friends and family. And, um, you know, those are people that are highly, you know, supportive because they, they believe in you and want to support you. And um, the other group of people that tend to invest in movies are professionals, doctors, dentists, lawyers, um, people who make a very good living. And this year, instead of going to Las Vegas and spending $10,000 gambling in the casinos, they're going to give the $10,000 to this young filmmaker who has lots of enthusiasm and they think it'll be uh, fun and exciting and they want to invite their friends to the screening of their movie. It's certainly not going to be any less risky than going to Las Vegas, that's for sure. <laughs> um, have you ever dealt with these new iPad release forms at all? iPad release forms? Yeah. <laughs> There's like a lot of um, apps out now that are supposedly like release forms for actors and things. I didn't know if you had seen any of those. I, I, ha I haven't seen that. Obviously, on, on a laptop computer or an iPad, you can... You can uh, look at it, uh, you know, documents, but you know, you need you need to have the person sign the document, and and uh, so at some point, usually, you need to put it on paper so they can sign it. Well, they even have like the little area you can sign, like on the on the surface, but I don't know if there have been any legal issues with that. But uh, it's kind of an interesting. Well, you know, it's really not, it's really not that expensive to print out, uh, you know, <laughs> most of these contracts. That's yeah, true. In my in my opinion. You don't really want to be the test case about whether <laughs> whether someone, you know, signing your, your iPad, you know, with their finger, you know, whether that's legally binding. I, I would just print it out and have them sign it. It's not that big a deal. Right. Um, now, I wanted to ask you a quick question about music in film. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of copyright free music that's online that's, um, you know, some of it is older orchestras and and you know, old pieces of music that also the recording is also um, not copyrighted or whatever. Is there any kind of like danger with using uh, music or do you see any filmmakers having problems with, you know, putting music that they've found online that's supposedly copyright free and it turns out it's not? Yeah, you, you know, anyone can set up a website and license music, which they may or may not own. And, you know, I'd be very wary ab about buying you know, music just from some website because if it turns out that the person who sold you the music doesn't have the rights to the music, guess what? You get nothing. You know, it's like if you go downstairs and, and, and uh, walk outside your office building and someone offers you a brand new red uh, Maserati for $10 and you buy it, and you know, do you, you think you get good title to that car? Uh, you don't. It's the parking valet who sold it to you for ten dollars, you know, and and you don't own it. And it's just it's the same thing with music or scripts or anything. If the person who ostensibly is selling it to you doesn't actually own the rights, you you don't get the rights. Okay, so you have to be careful about this the source of music. The the easiest, least expensive way to to put music on your soundtrack is to hire a really talented person who sits in a room with a synthesizer and they create the music, they record the music, they perform the music. It's a, you know, and nowadays with the technology, sometimes you can get a very uh, high quality sounding uh, soundtrack from that person and it's one contract and, and it's a good deal. Right. If you, if you have to start licensing the music for most independent filmmakers, they're not going to spend $50,000 to license a Bruce Springsteen song. It's just, it's just too much for, for their, their type of budget. Right. If you want to use public domain music, you know, you have to understand that there's a difference between the composition in the public domain and the recording being in the public domain. Um, a lot of great music is available. The composition is available for free because, you know, Beethoven, all of his music was, is now in the public domain because it was made a long time ago. And there's lots of music like that out there. But even though the composition is in the public domain, it doesn't mean the particular recording is going to be in the public domain. If you want to use a Beethoven's Fifth Symphony on your soundtrack, the composition's in the public domain. But if you go into a record store, so you can find a record store nowadays, and you buy a <laughs> recording by the Boston Symphony Pops of Beethoven's Fifth, that particular recording may still be under copyright, even though the composition is not. So you could take a public uh, domain uh, song and you could hire your own musicians and create your own recording. And that way you might get some pretty classy sounding music for not a lot of money. 
Um, or you could look for a recording that's also in the public domain, but that usually means it's more than 70 years old, and audio technology being what it is, most recordings that are more than 70 years old are pretty scratchy and don't really sound all that great. Another issue that I, I run up against a lot is the um, of shooting in public streets and shoot, trying to shoot films in, in places where they're not necessarily given um, – you know, the rights to shoot there, they don't have any sort of documentation. Is that something that can be a problem? Like, say, for example, you want to shoot in a public street somewhere, and even if you kind of get people that are visible on camera, is there? can you run into problems if you don't get the, the um, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> the, per- the permit. The permit. Yeah, sorry, the permit to shoot in, like, well, say, for example, there's, there's, like a park or something. Well, there's... there's- there's different issues. The, okay. the permit is between you and the county or the local government, and you know if they have permitting requirements. And certainly, if your your crew is substantial and you're going to pull up with a truck and lights and people, you probably don't want to risk you know some police officer coming up to you and saying, "Where's your permit?" Not having one and them kicking you out of there. Um, but you know, sometimes nowadays, you know, the crew is just two or three people, and they frankly don't look much different than uh, a bunch of tourists, you know, with their with their cameras. And they can sometimes, you know, shoot in public places without, you know, um, raising any any uh, notice, and and uh, and avoid, you know, uh, uh, being confronted with a, a lack of a permit. And I've certainly heard instances of young filmmakers just buying a bunch of uh, T-shirts from UCLA and having their, their crew uh, wear them. And if they get asked about it, they just say it's a student film. And even though there's really no legal reason why student films should be treated differently than any other <laughs> films, for some reason, apparently, when the police, say, you tell them it's a student film, maybe they, they won't bother. Um, the, the other issue is capturing other people on camera who aren't your actors who you don't have any kind of release with. I would say if it's a dramatic film, and you have actors on camera who are identifiable, in other words, not just a speck in the crowd in the background, you should get a release from them. If it's a documentary, it's not always required. You know, when 60 Minutes goes out and does a expose of the bad guys and has a camera, you know, and, and uh, you know, they knock on your door and they want to ask you questions, you know, they're not getting a release from that person who doesn't want to be interviewed. You know, and they're chasing them through the parking lot or down the courthouse steps. They're not getting a release. And so, generally speaking, you can film people out in public view, but you can't necessarily film them in the bathroom, in the hotel room, in an area where they have an expectation of privacy. And that's, say, for example, you're walking down a a public street, and even like a parade or something, like a Fourth of July parade or something, and you have two actors walking down the street. Can you run into trouble if, like, there's somebody in the background there that, you know, maybe sees that? I mean, is that something that would happen? that they would sue and say, oh, I didn't want to be in the background of this picture? Well, yeah, it could, it could be a problem. I mean, you could also, you know, blur their faces. You could, you could shoot right. it from a, a perspective where, you know, you can't really identify who they are. I mean, sometimes you see footage of people, all you see is their feet or their, you know, their backs, and, and you can't really identify them. And it's going to be very hard for them to make a case that this is them because, you know, lots of people wear the same type of sneakers and, you know, I mean, their feet are just not that distinctive where people would know who it is. Um, so, you know, it, it really, you know, depends upon the circumstances, but, you know, if it's not a documentary, if it's a narrative film where you have actors, you know, the, the better practice is always to get releases from anyone who, who someone watching the movie would be able to identify them. Right. And is that the same in terms of, let's say you go to, a national monument, you know, or like some private place where there's some very well-known structure that's like in a private area, would that need to be like signed off? Could they retroactively sue and say, oh, you weren't supposed to film in this place? Well, you mean like a, a public place like a the FBI building or uh, uh, Mount Rushmore? Well, for example, we were going to shoot some things um, in Yucatan in Mexico and there was a scene that was going to be filmed in some of the Mayan ruins that are in a private park. And we weren't sure whether there were going to be legal problems with that retroactive. I mean, we were going to shoot without asking for the permits. Um, just a really small scene, and I didn't know. I was always worried about it because I didn't know if that that was going to cause a problem later. Well, 
if, if you're abroad in a foreign country, you know, it, I think it's going to be very difficult um, if, if someone in a foreign country wants to sue you because they're probably going to have to come to the United States to sue you. And um, I don't see that, you know, easily, you know, uh, uh, happening. Um, uh, it, it's not an easy question to answer because it depends upon the circumstances. Right. Um, the, the, uh, buildings and, and architecture is subject of copyright, but there's an exception. Copyright for architecture is a little bit different than other copyrights in that if you uh, capture a building from a public place, like from a public street, you don't act, it, it's not an infringement of the copyright owner of the architecture of the building. Okay. So it's a little bit different. Um, g- generally speaking, you know, if, you, if you're shooting out in, in public streets, uh, you know, other than the permit requirements, especially if you're obstructing traffic, you definitely, you know, want to get a permit from the local authorities. Um, and you, you're going to need to have the police there to help, you know, control the crowds and whatever. Right. But, you know, if you're just like shooting a documentary, I mean, news crews go out all the time and they shoot the news, they shoot fires, they don't get releases. Mm-hmm. Well, I, the... I guess the idea that I'm I'm trying to understand is that most of this is geared towards trying to um, secure your E&O insurance, right? I mean, that's the main thing you want to be uh, covered for with all of these different things, right? Right. Okay. The, the answer to your question is, if, it's, if a major studio is doing it, they're going to want everything totally wrapped up, signed, permits for everything, location releases for everything. For independent films, you know, a lot of independent filmmakers are not as worried about being sued. First of all, because most independent filmmakers are just not that good a wealthy a target okay. for someone to file a lawsuit. I mean, who who in their right mind is going to sue some independent filmmaker, you know, living out of a rent-controlled apartment who doesn't have any money? I mean, you have to be pretty stupid to do that because even if you win, you're not going to be able to collect. But, you know, if, if the defendant is Paramount Pictures, you know if you win, you're going to be able to collect because right. they have lots of assets. Now, I, I wanted to change gears for a second and talk about the AFM and film markets and distribution. Now, what, what are currently the biggest markets, like the biggest events for selling films? I know there's Berlin and Cannes and AFM. Is there is there any more? Well, those are the big three, I would say. Okay. Uh, Berlin, AFM, and Cannes. And then there's also MIP and MIP TV that are in Cannes, France, and uh, something called NatBee, which uh, I think the next one is in Miami. Okay. And it's often in the United States. I mean, those are, those are the big film and TV markets, and there's some overlap. A lot of the buyers are the same in all of them. Okay. Now, I've never been to the AFM, but my impression is it's kind of chaotic. <laughs> Well, you could call it chaotic. You could call it vibrant. I mean, <laughs> if it's, it's a marketplace and there's buyers and sellers of films coming together, I mean, I think it's probably less chaotic than being at the, at the uh, stock exchange where people are selling <laughs> commodities and yelling and screaming at each other. It's a little bit more, more calmer than that. But, but yeah, there's a lot of activity going on. I mean, you have people from all over the world flying into AFM and they have to uh, license um, you know, a couple hundred films in the period of, you know, maybe a week or less. And so they're running around, you know, looking at a lot of stuff, you know, watching trailers on, on screens and suites of the various distributors going to actual theaters nearby to watch movies. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot of activity, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. What is the process for a filmmaker who wants to sell their, their film in at the AFM? Do they need to get special... Uh, like a booth? I mean, I really have no no knowledge of how, how it all works there. They could conceivably rent a booth, but it's expensive. And frankly, they don't. most filmmakers don't know anything about buying and selling films internationally. They don't know who the buyers in Turkey are. They, they, they don't know what a reasonable price for the film in Turkey is. They don't know how to make delivery to Turkey. And they, they basically don't want to be in that business anyway. They want to be off making their next film. So most filmmakers will retain a sales agent, a foreign sales agent, or international sales agent is what, what they're called. And these are people who specialize in, in licensing films throughout the world, and they have relationships all over the world. And when they rent a booth at AFM, they're not selling one film. They're, they're selling, you know, a bunch of films. So the cost of, the, of attending AFM is amortized over those films. And that's what they do. They And they, they know how to sell films, and also they handle you know, delivery, because, you know, when when the guy from Turkey licenses your film, he not only needs a copy of your film, 
Uh, he needs to sign, you know, a contract, obviously. He has, needs to remit payments. But he's also going to want copies of your artwork, your key art. He's going to want copies of, of still photos. He has to create a local campaign in Turkey to sell your film. And there's a whole bunch of different delivery items that you would have to give them, including a script that they can use to either dub or subtitle your film in another language. So the sales agents, if they're honest and, and you know, they're not overcharging you or deducting a whole bunch of illegitimate expenses, uh, provides a very valuable function for the filmmaker because they have the expertise in that area, and most filmmakers don't. They don't know how to sell their film, and even if they rented a booth in AFM, it's not clear that buyers would come to their booth because there's 200 other booths there with people who've been in the business many years, and and uh, you know a lot of the a lot of the buyers you know have a certain amount of comfort buying from companies that they've had relationships with over the years. They buy it. They buy a film from an independent filmmaker. They don't know from Adam, and the filmmaker you know doesn't doesn't deliver the film because you know the buyers usually. Uh, wire 100% of the money before they get the film. They don't get the film. They have no remedy. On the other hand, they buy it from a sales agent who they have a, a relationship with, and that sales agent values the relationship and is going to make sure that if there's a, a technical problem with the film they deliver, that it will be fixed or they'll substitute another film for it. So do you think that filmmakers should already have a, a relationship with the sales agents before they arrive? Well, if you're going, if, if you look, you can go to AFM, especially the last few days when things have quieted down a bit, and you can go there to meet sales agents for the next market. There's certainly nothing wrong with that. that that's, I, I always encourage my clients to meet with the sales agents in person, either at their offices or at a market. But, but um, you know, if you're, if you're going to a market, you know, and, and, you're, and, and you're not experienced in the business and you're going to either, you know, rent a booth or try to sell the film out of your suitcase walking along the halls, it, it, you're not going to likely to have much success, and and that's not a good idea. And so, you, if you're going to get a foreign sales agent, you should get one at least two months before the market, because you need to let the foreign sales agent prepare for the market. They need they need to reserve screening rooms. They need to include you in their trade ads. They need they need to alert their buyers of the upcoming films. They need to do a whole bunch of preparation work. And if you just if you just sign up with them at the last moment, you're really doing yourself a big disservice. And, and the first market that your film is sold in is by far the most important market. Because at the second market, the buyer see your film and says, oh, I remember that from the last market. Oh, it still hasn't sold in, in Bulgaria. Well, I guess, you know, it's not such a hot, hot item, is it? <laughs> and the price they're willing to pay goes down. You had mentioned that the, the sales for the U.S. are much more difficult than selling to the international market. Are there, what, what are the major international markets right now? For films, well, China um, has come come up um, tremendously. Uh, Japan, South Korea, France, Italy, Spain, the UK, Germany. You know, those are the countries that are the major markets in the sense that they write the bigger checks. If you sell your film to Albania, it's nice, um, but you know, you're not going to get a very big check from Albania because it's a very small country, and and. Uh, you know, that's it. But there's a lot of countries that buy American films. And, you know, if you sell to 50, 60, even small countries, it adds up after a while. Now, can you describe the process when a, let's say a, um, someone wants to buy your film, do you need to have things there ready for them? I mean, documents and everything is, does everything happen at the AFM or is it just you, you say, okay, we agree to do this and then we'll talk about it later or we'll, we'll figure everything out later. No, you mean between the sales agent and the buyer? Yeah. Well, often the the parties will sign a short form deal memo, okay. um, like a two page deal memo summarizing the deal the, the deal terms. Um, sometimes, if it's a big territory, you know, and a lot of money is going to take place, um, they may want a DVD to take it back to the home office and get other people to see it before they make this commitment. Um, the short form, you know couple page contract is usually followed up with a long form agreement that's usually done you know a number of months after the market is over um, and then the seller the sales agent on behalf of the filmmaker sends a notice of tentative delivery to the buyer saying we're ready to deliver the film and now you need to send us the rest of the money often the, the buyers will make a deposit of 20 20 percent of the license fee up front to to basically buy the film or reserve the film 
and sign the deal memo, and the other 80% they have to wire before they get the film. Okay, and are the legal aspects different for every country that you're working with? Do you have to, I mean, I assume they're doing different contracts in each of the, like, no. say you're say, no, say, they're, no, they're not. And most, okay. the, the vast majority of people use the IFTA forms, you know, the, uh, uh, the organization IFTA that runs AFM, they have model forms, which actually anyone can buy from IFTA, and those are the forms that are used, and some sales agents do a slight variation of it, but, but the forms are familiar to the buyers and the sellers, and they're comfortable with them, and, and they're all in English, and, and even though they're detailed, you know, people in the business understand them. If you, if, you, you know, if you have a whole bunch of different contracts in different languages, it would really be unworkable. So they're, <laughs> they're, all, they're, all in, they're all in English, and they're somewhat standardized. What are the majority of the, the deals that you see? Are they primarily for DVD releases or are any of them theatrical or does it just depend? Well, the, the foreign buyer, the, the, the buyer from Switzerland who buys your film, they're usually buying all rights in Switzerland. They may not necessarily exploit all rights okay. in Switzerland and they may not exploit all the rights themselves. The, the buyer in Switzerland could be someone who owns a group of theaters in Switzerland, and they're primarily interested in the theatrical rights, and then they're going to try to turn around and license the TV rights to a local TV station and make a deal with a local home video company. Or the buyer from Switzerland could be a home video company, and they're, and they're going to buy all the rights, and they may or may not release it theatrically, you know, and, and they may license it to TV. Um, a lot of times the buyers don't directly themselves exploit all the rights, but they want to secure all the rights and then they may sublicense some of them to other parties in their territory. Okay, and now in the U.S., what um, do you find that people are, are primarily focused on foreign markets now because it's so much harder to sell in the U.S.? Well, I, I know about uh, focused. I would say most independent filmmakers would really like their film to be shown in the theater near them and where their <laughs> mother and father can come and see it with the, right. uh, a crowd giving them a standing ovation. But So that's what they're often focused on, whether they can achieve that or not depends. The, the U.S. market is extremely competitive. There's lots of films competing for theaters. Um, a lot of independent filmmakers nowadays, you know, can't get a theatrical release unless they're willing to pay for it. Um, but, you know, there are, are new ways of licensing films. I mean, there's been a lot of activity recently with filmmakers licensing films to Netflix and, and some new buyers and Amazon and whatever who in the past haven't been um, uh, licensees of, of films. So, you know, if you have a really good film, you know, you know, you can, you can, you know, uh, get it out there. It, it may not be on a 2000 screen release across the United States because most independent films are just not going to get that kind of uh, release, you know, behind them. But, you know, it's not at all unusual to have a film, you know, shown in a handful or maybe even a few hundred theaters and then, and then, you know, uh, generate revenue through um, VOD and, and home video and all the other ways of exploiting films. I assume that most people want to do theatrical just more for uh, prestige at this point. Well, the theatrical release is, is good for one's ego and, uh, <laughs> but it's also, but it's also good because a lot of the foreign buyers, if the film has got a, has had a significant theatrical release in the United States, they view it differently and are willing to pay more for it than if it's a film that's direct to video or direct to TV. So, so it, it's, it's, um, uh, I mean, what the theatrical release does, the theatrical release is, is often not necessarily profitable in its own right because it's so expensive. But what the theatrical release does is it builds awareness for the film. And so a lot of times when people, you know, order a film, you know, over the Internet on on um, on TV or, or Hulu or whatever, it's often a film they heard about when it was in theaters, but they didn't get around to seeing it. So even even though the theatrical release may not be profitable in its own right, um, it does build awareness for the film, and that increases the license fees you're going to get from home video and television. If that's the case, would it be important for people to try to have a theatrical release before they come to the American film market so that they could sell it with that prestige, or is that possible? It depends on the film. I would okay. say if you have a film that really is not is going to not be something that people are going to pay to go to see in a theater, then going to a theatrical release, I'm not sure it gets you very far. It's probably just waste some money and waste some time. But, <laughs> but for some films, it's very important if it's a festival-type film to get it into the top festivals. And in a okay. sense, that's a 
somewhat of a substitute for being in theaters. But if it's successful in some of the top film festivals, it wins award at Sundance, it probably will get into theaters also after that. <laughs> um, so it really depends a lot on the on the type of film you have. You know, if you have a film that that really the economics are against you for for showing it theatrically and generating any revenue, you don't accomplish a great deal showing it in a bunch of theaters to an empty empty house. Um, but you know, in in some instances, having the film shown in theaters can be can be very good. But it, it's very difficult nowadays to secure theaters on a traditional. Uh, revenue sharing basis with the theater owner because you're competing against Paramount and Fox, and Sony, who have these big blockbuster movies. And, you know, the average theater owner, they'd, they'd rather show Spider-Man 6 than, than your little film because they're going to make a lot more money on Spider-Man 6, not to mention the fact that they make a lot of money at the candy stand. And so even if they're only getting a relatively small portion of the ticket price, because most of it's going back to the studio, they're selling a lot of popcorn and candy, and that's where they and they keep a hundred percent of that revenue. When you're talking about foreign sales, um, one of the things you had mentioned before was um, that you can make a lot of money in certain, you know, countries like say Spain or Germany. Um, do you find that many independent films that are under a million dollars are able to just make back all their funding by selling a, a good product to those foreign markets? I would say. No, I, I would say most independent films don't, don't make back their money. Okay. Um, uh, you know, because the market is very tough, and um, I would say more often than not, investors don't don't recoup their investment. On the other hand, you know, if you make a really good film and it gets out there and it gets some great reviews and it shows that you can really have have the talent to make a movie, even if the movie isn't profitable, it can be a tremendous boost to your career. And now all of a sudden you're getting offered, you know, other films to direct um, and being paid quite handsomely for it. So, um, you know, the film business is extremely risky and, and very difficult to make money in. Um, but every year a few films come out of nowhere and, and do extremely well because the audience really cares mostly about the story and not necessarily where it comes from. What are the... Uh, what would you consider the most important resources for filmmakers if they wanted to learn about what was going on in foreign sale? I mean, are there any online publications? Is there where can they really kind of educate themselves about the, the for, what people are buying and, and distributors are looking for? Is there any sort of central area? Well, you can read the trade papers. That's that's for sure. Um, and um, I actually written a book called Risky Business: Financing <laughs> and Distributing Independent Films, which talks about the, you know, the, the um, industry and, and these deals and the legalities of it and how this all works. Um, uh, you know, the, the prices that are paid vary over time, and uh, probably only the sales agents who are in the front line of selling are going to know that Germany is a little bit down or a little bit up compared to the last market. I mean, that, that's not going to be information that's readily available because it changes constantly. Now, is there a role of, um, like, aggregators at the AFM? I mean, are those are sales agents dealing with aggregators or? Is... Well, some, some sales agents have, have aggregators is usually a, a term that is used for distributors, often the home video distributors in the United States that mm -hmm. will put out a film on home video, but also nowadays will license it to iTunes and Netflix and all those other forms. And the, the reason that aggregators are important is that Netflix doesn't want to negotiate with individual filmmakers for one film. They'd rather negotiate with a home video company that has a library of 500 films, make a deal and get the whole library. You know, I mean, the transactional cost, the legal cost of negotiating a contract for an individual film, you know, don't, don't make a lot of sense to them. So most independent filmmakers have a hard time selling their films themselves directly to Netflix, even if it's for a very good price. Because Netflix, you know, really wants to buy films by the bushel load, not not individuals. So aggregators are nowadays a lot of them are home video companies that not only will put out the film on DVDs, but also um, put it out on VOD and SVOD and you know all the other new new ways that people are watching movies. Do you find that's kind of the last resort for films at all? <laughs> like going to Netflix, if they haven't gotten a distribution deal somewhere else? Well, I don't think it's a last resort. I mean, we've had clients who have made huge amounts of money from Netflix. I mean... Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, huge amounts of money. It's amazing. 
Um, it, I mean, um, I mean, Netflix and there's a company called Redbox that basically has these vending machines all over the country that have, you know, also generate, you know, a fair amount of uh, revenue. You know, I mean, some, a lot of the home video stores are gone. They're, they're not even, you know, Blockbuster is gone, you know. So, you know, the, everything is changing and, and there's new ways of distributing films. And in some ways, it's a very exciting time and there's a lot of activity going on. And, and um, you know, but, uh, you know, the, these are becoming the primary sources. Home, home video revenue for packaged media, which means like, you know, DVDs and Blu-rays has actually gone down in the past few years. The more and more people are getting um, their programming, you know, over the internet or by satellite or, you know, various forms of VOD. And that seems to be the trend. Well, my impression has always been that Netflix just didn't pay filmmakers very much. But maybe I guess that's wrong. Then That's totally wrong. I have okay. filmmakers who made, <laughs> I have a filmmaker who made a documentary film who's gotten huge six figure checks and then they renewed and paid another huge amount of money. Oh, well, that's, um, that, that's absolutely wrong. I mean, you know, it depends upon the film. If the right. film is good, you know, they're, they're, they have a lot of money. They're buying a lot of stuff. You know, Amazon, Hulu, it, there's a whole bunch of Yahoo all out there, you know, uh, trying to, you know, build up their libraries of material. When you talk about the aggregators, are those the who, who's setting the price for the films? Is it the deal between the the filmmaker and the aggregator or is it related? I mean, how does that work? Well, it's a negotiation. Right. I mean, the, the aggregator, let's say it's a home video company that's also licensing product to Netflix, they're going to try to get as big a license fee as they can, and Netflix is probably going to want to, you know, pay as little as it can get away with, but there's competition, and, you know, there's a lot of people, you know, for a desirable film, there's a lot of people who, who want it. And is that something that's coming directly out of AFM? AFM is a venue to show the film. I mean, some films get noticed at AFM, some films get noticed at Sundance, some films get noticed at South by Southwest. Okay. Some films, the filmmaker rents the theater and shows it and, you know, get, gets noticed that way. It's hard to, there's not one path. Right. Okay. Well, great. I, I really appreciate the <laughs> kind of, I have a million different questions, but I know you, you don't have that much time. So um, I appreciate it. You're very, you're very welcome. Good, good luck. Well, thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Bye. I want to thank Mark Litwat for coming on today, and I really think that um, he's given us a lot of great information, especially to those of us who wince a little when you, you know, whenever you start talking about legal issues and things like that. Um, if you like this podcast, please subscribe and leave us a, a review, and of course, check us out indiefilmacademy.com. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Academy podcast. Don't forget to join our newsletter for more tips and tricks on how to make and market your film online. Go to www.indiefilmacademy.com. Finally, a local printing company with the savings of an online printer. Printdirtcheap.com. Printdirtcheap.com. Ridiculously cheap printing without sacrificing quality. We use state-of-the-art technology to print better, faster, and cheaper than anyone else in town. In fact, Printdirtcheap.com, our online store, is one of the fastest-growing printing sites in the country. For full color or even black and white, visit Printdirtcheap.com today and see the savings for yourself. Want samples? Request a free sample pack at Printdirtcheap.com. Printdirtcheap.com. Ridiculously cheap printing.